My name is Tom Kubek, K-U-B-E-C-K. I was in the Navy from in February of 44 to June of 46. I was just a plain sig signalman, uh, a signalman, a seaman first class. We call them strikers. I went to boot camp at Samson, New York for 13 weeks. And then I went to school in Newport, Rhode Island for 13 weeks at gunnery school. Gunnery? Gunnery, yes, to be a gunner's mate. Mm -hmm. And then I got put on the LS LCT, Landing Craft Tank, LCT 418. And that, that was put on the LST landing ship tank in, uh, in Norfolk, Virginia. That crane that lifted the thing, put it right on, on the deck. And then I transferred over to the LST-1000. The other ship was, it was too small. I, I just didn't care for the cramped quarters like that. So I got on LC, LST, and that begins the history. The food, you know, many times we carried, oh, say from Pearl Harbor to another place, one of the islands, chicken, frozen chicken, or canned cherries, or these are the things that, that I don't want to say we stole them because it's, you know, you're doing that because you're hungry, but, right. but everybody had chicken and um, pies made with that, well, with that um, cherries. And we were one of the first ones that ever tried that it was called, let's see, you had your K rations, or 10 and 1. Yeah, that was good. And everybody took a case of that. But our whole tank deck, you know, almost 300 feet long, was filled with cases of that. They needed a signalman, and they couldn't get one from anywhere. so. They announced over the PA system that anyone who would like to try out to be a signalman, you know, to try, they, they would go right through the train and, and put you on, up, up, up on the crow's nest up there practically. Anyhow, I, I passed that, and every night I would practice with the light and then the flags. And the blinker. The, well, yeah, but, but what we did was the, the petty officer who was in charge of the signalman, I guess he kind of liked me or something, but he made a, a little gadget with a light, you know, flashlight bulb on it, hooked up to a battery and a key. So I would tap that and learn the Morse code that way. Even now, and I, I sometimes think I'm going crazy, I will send a message from one foot to the other, especially if the, the room is small and I'm up against the wall tapping out a code <laughs> or and I'm listening to the television, and it's an interesting word, and I, I get dot out, you know. Yeah. So I don't know if I was going nuts or not. But anyway, I enjoyed uh, being in the Navy. I enjoyed signalman's duties, four on, eight off, with the lights and stuff, and there were four of us. So we had the whole 
upper deck to take care, like officers' country. We took care of that for the officers. Well, I learned all of that, and then after a while, I they put me on watch by myself, and and I rather enjoyed it. I was on the four the four one eight, the uh, t uh, landing craft tank, yeah. LCT. Yeah. We went down to Norfolk, Virginia, and that's where they put the LCT on. Then we left and went through the canal, which incidentally I went through twice since then on cruises, you know, just to s s reminisce and see what I missed and how interesting it was. Then from there we went to Pearl Harbor. That was rather sad, you know, because oil was still coming out of the water. But we all had to dress, you know, in our undress blues, and line the line the whole ship. And, and then, then we went to, I think it was Peleliu, a little island. And from there, we just kept hopscotching until we ended up at Ulithi with, with the, these 155 Long Tom, I think the Marines had them, whatever they were. Anyway, so we knew we were in for some kind of thing, you know? Because we were close enough, every night this old bomber would come by and make a lot of noise, and, you know, try to keep us awake. But it never got shot down. I could never understand that with all the destroyers and things around, around the area. We invaded uh, Okinawa on uh, Easter Sunday, April 1st. Uh, it was amazing to me and to everybody on board because we encountered absolutely no resistance. Pulled up. I, I have a picture of our, our ship. So we just pulled up and discharged the. Oh, well, it's somewhere in here. Second, second page. See that one on the bottom? You'll see the LC LST right over here. Yeah. That that your that yours? Yes. One like. Yes. If you look carefully, you'll see me up at the conning tower. <laughs> there. <again. laughs> we went ashore. The Navy. Oh, oh, you did. Just looking, you know, walking around on yeah. solid ground. Uh, but we couldn't go after t three or four or five days. They just wouldn't let us go yeah. anywhere near it. Yeah. And we pulled out of there and had our side, our starboard side, caved in or stoved in by another ship, which glanced off another ship and lost control and hit us. So we had to go to Guam to get repaired since they had the big dry docks there. That was like being a, hur a hurricane out on the beach or something, in the water. Only the wind was blowing the opposite. But that was something. It wasn't a dry thing that was on the ship. It was like your dust storms where the water got everywhere. Well, I only got into one fight, if that's what you mean. 
And that was on the ship's birthday. So they had, you know, a makeshift ring. And, and this fellow and I just, we just didn't care for each other. So we, we, we fought for three rounds. The gloves got rather heavy. <laughs> They were all right. Uh, one of them comes, came to our reunion all the time, Mr. Scannell. He was, he was nice. Mr. Morton, I didn't know this until he called me. In. He was executive officer for a while. Then he became the captain. But when he was executive officer, he called me in and asked me, what, where I was from, and I told him, Wallingford, Connecticut. And he said, oh, he went to Choate School there at Wallingford. And I said, oh, my father worked at Choate School. And he said, did he work in this particular area? He was one of the groundskeepers. And I said, yes. He said, well, he, he would let them go in to the house uh, hot house, whatever you call them, and smoke. See, uh -huh. <laughs> so he knew him. Yeah. And he saved my butt once, because I was put in jail in Shanghai. And he, don't ask me why. <laughs> the other one, I was put in jail in Korea. Well, we had just come from South Pacific to Korea, and it was cold. I mean, it was bitter cold. We had no, no clothing. Everything was rotten, you know. One of the ships was burning. We were in Pusan, a place where this big barrier went up, kept the water in, so you were always up here, and the ocean was down here. And then when the tide came in, they opened up. Anyway, there were like a number of ships in there. One of them was an L C L S M landing ship something. And it was burning. It had some kind of fire going on. And all of these sailors were coming out with these nice fur lined Eisenhower things. So we went over, three or four of us, in the longboat and threw down a, oh, tons of them, one for everybody on board, at least. And when we got to the shore to, to take them to the ship, you weren't in the cavalry, were you? Because I have a... I have a cavalry commission, but I wasn't really in the cavalry. Oh, okay. Because I think a fifth cavalry or something. The first, yeah, first cavalry. had his forty-five out and arrested all of us for misappropriation of government property, and that was jail time. But it was a wicked, awful jail. Awful, it was small, and you had to go in through a little door that you crawl in. And for your facilities, you just had a little hole there in the corner. And, and everyone was thrown in there. One of the persons that was in there was a murderer. He had committed murder. <laughs> yeah. So we stayed kind of together. And then Mr. Morton got us out. But not, he, he let us, he said he would handle get general court martial and all of that. But he did, he was a nice, nice guy. But we, I got along. Most everyone got along with the officers except my best friend, Victor Alcavetti. Yes. <laughs> he just couldn't take orders. He just didn't. But he's the nicest guy in the world, he was. 
to me, being in the Navy, now, this is not going to sound right, but I think you'll know what I mean when I say, for me, it was very romantic. It was like I was on a quest for something. I even enjoyed the train ride from Wallingford, my hometown, to, yeah. to New Haven, 16 miles away, yeah. to put up my hand. Yeah. We were all standing in a row yeah. after the physical. Yeah. And, uh, and you were part of it. Yes, ready to take the, the oath. Yeah. And the Marine sergeant came in and asked if anyone wanted to, you know, go get in the Marine. And one or two did. But, but he said, that's not enough. So he went along, you, 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 and you. So I said, well, I don't want to be a, a Marine. I want Navy. And oh, he got real upset. And then the officer, doctor, who was in charge, said, he's an enlisted man. <laughs> so oh, he said, sorry. So they were just going after draftees, you know, people who were drafted. But I would have canceled my enlistment if that were the case. Uh, one of the funniest parts of this whole thing is you know, my two buddies and I in, in Connecticut, just great friends, we decided to join the Navy. So we, yeah. yes, t the three of us, we're all the same age. Same grade and everything. So we went to <laughs> join up and took our physical. And guess who failed? Both of them. Both of them failed and I was on my own <laughs> after that. But I, I, I liked it. I, I didn't get in any trouble at all. But, you know, no one picked on me or anything like that. Yeah. You know, when the planes were coming over and the suicide bombers and hitting ships all around us, you came a it kind of, yes, you got kind of frightened. Yeah. <laughs> Being at war, the greatest thing that ever came out of it was the GI Bill, where we could go to college. That was a, a changed America. If we didn't have that, we would almost still be wearing gray suits, you know, instead of colorful, colorful outfits. I was injured, and so my education was free. Yeah. Uh, I was under a different bill. I didn't realize it until after. There are two, two or three bills. One of injured people. If, you, if I spent a month in the service and got injured in the war, then my education was free. Or if I spent five years in there, it was free for four years. I was getting 75 a month for four years. And I made the big mistake huge mistake. They said, what would you like to be? What do you want to become when, when this Veterans Affairs person interviewed me after the war? And I said, oh, I don't know. And uh, he said, well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's try teaching. I said, oh, okay. My father would like that. He was from Poland, see, so he didn't understand English too well. And to be a professor was uh, just the highest. Yeah. So I said that, but it didn't, I didn't realize that I could, if I said what I really wanted to be, a doctor, they would pay for everything. And I didn't know that. And when, when I came out of the service, I went to Cheshire Academy because I, didn't, I quit in, in the 10th grade. And whenever we played chote, I always asked 
the coach if I could pitch. And he says yes, so I would pitch against Choate. My father would be sitting there very proud. During the typhoon, we were asked to batten down everything. And this, on, on the tank deck, on the main deck, a lot of this oil and stuff was up there. And the ship was almost turning over. Yeah. So I slid there, and, and fortunately there's about a two or three inch little scupper going all the way around the ship with holes in it for water to get off. And that stopped me, but it tore up my knee. So I, I have a new one now. But that one is hurting this one. <laughs> so anyhow, and I still get it. I get a check. I used to buy a car with with the check every three years. We shot, we shot down one plane and had three helping hands, halves. Since I was a gunner's mate at one time, they put me on a 20 mil millimeter gun. So when we, ha we had general quarters, that was my station not up with the signalman. Right. I was more frightened when the war ended because when we found out that Jap Japan surrendered, every ship in the harbor shot guns and did all kinds. And stuff was falling all over the place. I guess a lot of people didn't realize what goes up has got to come down. But uh, it came down. That was something that they, that when the when the bomb was dropped, oh, we got some stories about that too. The atomic bomb. Well, we were in Saipan, in Tinian, and Yap Island, wherever it was. Anyway. And so we saw all these B-29s coming and landing all the time. But they wouldn't let us get around one of these ships, one of the planes. And that might have been the one that had the bomb. But when it was dropped, I didn't know, I didn't know what an atomic bomb was. So we asked the officers, and they explained. One of them was clever and explained it. But uh, that would have been some devastation there. But we saw B-29s come back with half the tail ripped up and holes in the wing. I know how these guys ever did it. That, to me, would be frightening, you know, being up there. At least I knew how to swim, so I was, that was all right. You'd be surprised how many sailors didn't know how to swim. Of course, at night, you turn out all lights, and you start at dusk. Well, just at dusk, we happened to see, and I was on the lights at night. We happened to see uh, all these lights. Oh. And it was a hospital ship, USS Comfort. And what it was going by, a suicide plane, Kamikaze, came down and struck the hospital ship. So we signaled, you know, signaled, do you need any aid? And they said yes. So we we started to line up the tank deck with all of these cots that we had because, uh, you know, everybody would be wounded yeah. on that hospital ship. But when we got close by, they said they had it under control. Mm -hmm. 
what we did was we were up at, by Shanghai and they sent us up a little further up and we got a thousand soldiers, officers and stuff, of Japanese and took them to Sasebo, Japan. Then we went back to Shanghai and picked up a thousand more and we just kept doing that back and forth until the last one we took was, they had a, a, about a thousand civilians. But it was amazing what they did. We built comfort stations for them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. On yeah. one side or the other, yeah. depending on which way the wind was blowing. Yeah. And for their meals, we gave them brand new GI cans, the big ones, you know, the corrugated ones. Mm -hmm. And what they would do was put, a, put some rice in, I don't know how much rice, and water, and then take our steam hose and the stern, uh, uh, we had a the stern, stick it in there, yeah. and cook it, and throw all this fish, and whatever they threw in there. Yeah. But three or four of them were always there making what I, we call snowballs, mm -hmm. you know, little round balls. Mm -hmm. And the soldiers would come and pick up their food, you know. That, that was interesting because the first time we had guards who were from Guadalcanal, the Marines who had been through all that fighting. And I don't know how many, but let's just say we had a thousand Japanese prisoners. By the time we got to Sasebo, Japan, there might have been 991 or something like that. With, because we were, in, we were at, at Guadalcanal on one of our trips. And whew, those poor guys, I felt so sorry for them. One fellow had a knife, a little pocket knife, mm -hmm. and he wasn't around the next day. You mean one of the prisoners? Yeah. yeah, just kind of fell overboard or something. But that's, that's just the way it was. I'm sure that if it were the reverse, it would have been much more brutal. I, I had six brothers who were in the service. Six four, Yes, four of us saw World War II duty and the two youngest right after me uh, served, you know, one in the Navy, one in the Marine, but not in World War II. I taught school down in Florida. I got my master's at uh, North Carolina and then a job in in a little place called Pahokee in Palm Beach County on Lake Okeechobee. Yeah. And I stayed there for two years, then I transferred to uh, Delray Beach. We had a son, but he had hemophilia, and none of the doctors down there wanted to treat him because it, you know, there wasn't enough money in it for them. Uh, so we had to, we moved up to Washington, D.C., where my wife was from, and went to the children's hospital there and took care of that. So I, I just taught then. Then I went into the government and taught supervision and management courses for 20-something years. I used my brother's birth certificate. He wasn't, see, I have, there are seven of us. Mm -hmm. I'm number seven. 
two sisters. And number six had a permanent disability, so he couldn't go in. Yeah. So I used his birth certificate and went 